Um, so a, a friend of mine is a, is a personal trainer. Um, and we've had a couple conversations uh, at various points about kind of what he does and um, how he helps people uh, become healthier. And, uh, and when I think about my, my friend's job and what he's trying to do as a personal trainer, I think about what James is trying to do here in this letter that he, we've been reading since January. James is dealing with passions and desires. And he's writing to, to new followers of Jesus whose, whose lives are filled with conflicting desires. Um, I, I actually, like conflicting isn't really a strong enough word uh, because if you look at the end of verse one, James chapter four, he says, your passions are at war within you. Right? And so there's this like intensity to what James is describing here. There is an internal war in him. And he goes on to say that, that, that some of these desires have serious consequences. As, as I listen to my friend talk about his work as a personal trainer, then I actually hear some of these same themes. Um, think about, maybe you've gone to a personal trainer, but think about somebody who would go to one, like paying somebody to tell you how to be more active and like what to eat, you reveal like some of your desire, right? Like something inside of you wants to change if you're willing to go to a person and pay them and say, help me out here. But then how quickly that desire is challenged, right? The moment you sort of show up and are looking this personal trainer in the face and uh, this new trainer begins to give you some instructions that don't sound awesome. And you immediately sort of discover that, that you don't want to do any of the things that he suggested. And you can, you can step out of personal training and health and, and you, all of us should be able to recognize the same conflict in other areas of our lives, places where we want something but then the moment we're really facing it, do we really want it? You might want to be more, more productive during the day, during your work. And so you start reading blogs on productivity and you immediately feel the tension. You really want to change, but you also really don't want to do any of the things that are recommended. Or, or maybe, maybe you've never had a savings account and you really want to start saving money. You're just tired of having to sort of get bailed out uh, every time you get hit by a surprise bill. And so you go to a financial workshop and discover that, that while you want to be in a better financial position, you really don't want to change the way that you spend your money. Like, you know this conflict, right? And at least some area of your life, you want to see change. And you expect to have to do something about it, but you don't really want to work for it. Not that hard anyway. And that's the thing that we're talking about. Um, that's the thing when like, we're talking about real change, that, that anything real and lasting just requires real effort. In all of these areas, right? Change requires new habits. Um, that need to be formed, new eating habits or habits around being active or new work habits or new uh, spending habits. And, and new habits just take time to form and they take this like constant remembering that you even want to form a new habit and they take repetition. And then even in those moments where you just at, like more than anything feel like you don't want to do this new thing, like it's what's required if you are going to form this new habit. And so I'd be willing to guess that every single one of us has some experience trying to establish a new habit. And, and this is maybe where, probably where most of us have failed when we've tried to change something. We, 
we focus, we tend to focus almost entirely on the new habit, the new thing that I want to do. Um, and we give hardly any thought to the old habits that need to die, that need to go away. Uh, my, my personal trainer friend um, gave me this really interesting insight that, that I think is relevant for our passage this morning. Um, he told me that, that when it comes to changing the way you eat, you, you have to essentially reset your body and its desires. We, we generally um, eat poorly in terms of the kinds of food that we eat. And what we find is that we've often been eating this way for so long that we've trained our bodies to actually crave certain kinds of foods. And, and, our, and so our eating is this like really complex mix of like multiple kinds of habits all tied to desires that we have for these certain kinds of foods. And so he requires his clients to eat in this very specific way, free of certain foods for a clearly defined period of time. One of the things that makes his approach difficult is that um, he doesn't allow cheat days. You have to make the whole period of time if you expect to see any lasting change or new habits. And, and what he essentially argues is that cheat days don't actually allow you to break free from the old desires. Um, the, the cheat days let you keep literally feeding that desire, even if just once a week, so that while you might be desiring some like new foods, you desire for old foods, your, your desire for those old, old foods is still being fed. And because you've been eating those old foods for so long, it's, it's actually not really a co competition when it comes between the old foods and the new foods. When it comes down to it in a moment of weakness, you'll always turn to the old desires every day because that's what you know, that's what's comfortable, that's what's safe and secure. Isn't it interesting that when you're trying to eat in a new way, those days when you give yourself permission to go back to your old ways of eating are called cheat days. Look at verse four. Listen to James. You adulterous people. Can you hear what James just said? You cheaters. Jesus has just introduced you. This is what James has been, been telling it to a whole new way of life, a way of life that's found only in him. Jesus has, has shown you a better way to be human. Jesus has brought you back to God's design for human fullness and flourishing. He has started to form new desires in you. But you are adulterous, James says. You're cheating on God. James goes on to say, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Can you hear my, my personal trainer friend here? Don't you know that friendship with your old way of eating is hostile to your new way of eating? Whoever wishes to keep eating old food makes himself an enemy of the new food. See, following Jesus is a difficult way of life. Jesus describes it as a narrow way for a reason. It's not an accident that Jesus describes following him as carrying a cross. It is costly. And our baptism tells us the cost. We're told that in our baptisms, we, we die to ourselves so that Jesus might, might raise us new. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't always want the life that Jesus is offering us. I mean, like, like us, even Christians, people who have known and experienced God's love, like when we're candid, sometimes it just sounds too hard, like, like too much. And then even in those moments where, where we want it, like really want it. There are other things that we've wanted for so long and our desires for those things don't just go away all of a sudden. 
as hard as the Christian life can be, I think that we often make it much harder on ourselves. We try to live out our faith with cheat days. So that that these new desires to love God and love neighbors, that, that the spirit is starting to form in us when the much older desires to live for myself, to look out for myself, to gratify myself, when these come into contact, there's a war. And we keep giving permission to these old desires to have a place in our lives. Cheat days allow us to keep feeding our old desires and and those old desires are powerful. And our new desires will often be defeated by the old ones. Which means that sometimes our new desires never fully bloom into something that's sustainable and that's full and that gives drive and direction to our lives. I actually think that this is one of the hardest teachings in all of James, if not the the New Testament for us today. Um, the, The reason is this, like, We live in a culture that values authenticity above almost anything else. Authenticity, which means before anything else, we have got to be true to ourselves. That the outside always has to look exactly like what the inside is. And and we will struggle, like really struggle to call any of our inner desires bad or wrong or disordered because like what I feel, what I want is who I am, right? Isn't it? At least that's what our culture says, that everything that is inside is who I am and I need to be that on the outside. And especially if my desires don't hurt anyone, if my desires don't cause me to murder anyone or hate anyone or steal from anyone, then then we generally just assume that my desires must be good from God, at least neutral. Here's the crazy thing about the world that we live in today. Like our desires, because of our culture of authenticity might actually be one of the most examined parts of our lives. Like, especially in our culture, we are constantly trying to answer questions like, who am I and what do I want? And, and if we're honest, we know what we want. We, we could tell you right now the things that I want, the things that I am pursuing in, our, in my life, and, and we're trying to live by what we want. The issue for us isn't knowing ourselves. The issue is submitting ourselves. And I've heard people try to justify, and I've done this as well, just about every single sin that there is, often using scripture to do it because we just don't want to submit that part of our lives to God. We are convinced it's okay to want the things that we want. And we either deny or we ignore the fact that, that someone else taught us Someone else trained us to desire the things we desire. Consider this sort of ridiculous and harmless example. Um, If you desire Doritos, you have a desire that is completely unique to this time and place in history. I mean, Doritos are a new invention, a tasty invention an invention that nobody in the 1400s ever desired. They didn't even know that Doritos were a thing to desire. But see, I grew up in a culture where Doritos were a cheap and easy snack. Uh, In my fifth grade class, we had this store uh, where we sold Doritos to other kids. And so I was ready to profit off of them. Every day after school, the, the shows that I watched were uh, filled with commercial breaks advertising Doritos while I was eating Doritos. And I grew up watching the Super Bowl where Doritos commercials 
are usually some of the best and the funniest. In fact, as I'm talking about Doritos, I can actually feel my mouth beginning to water in this moment. Uh, we live in a world where Doritos have been invented, where they have been marketed to me and fed to me. And there are plenty of people who are responsible. At some point, I became responsible for uh, deliberately uh, forming this habitual desire to eat Doritos. That, interestingly, decreases the longer I go without them. And you could really go down a list of the stuff that we desire, stuff like brands and cars and vacations and stuff. I mean, our culture has formed a desire for these things in us in so many different ways. But, but you could even look at careers and status. So 15 years ago, there was no such thing as YouTube. Um, but did you know that today, a career that you could aspire to is to be a YouTube star? That that's like a thing. When a kid says that they want to be a YouTube star, you go, where did that come from? Right? Where did that desire come from? Because 15 years ago, that desire did not exist among human beings because YouTube didn't exist. But it came from watching lots of YouTube comes from seeing over and over again the kind of attention that these channels and young stars get. And we discover that this desire isn't natural. It's formed in our kids. Jane has this uh, great line that she uses uh, when our daughters have occasionally, um, at various times, told us that, that they'd like to be famous when they get older. Um, Jane always lovingly and tenderly says, oh, sweetheart, we love you too much to let you do that to yourself. And in a small way, attempts to form her desires or to counterform the influences around us that say, yeah, being famous is like a good thing. It's a thing that we ought to seek out and pursue. But you don't have to just look at the desires that might be considered negative. Like you could easily look at really good things to see how, how desire is formed in us. So I have sort of noticed that there are very few people who watch Christians receive communion, who go, huh, I gotta get me a piece of that tiny bread in that cup. Right? I need it now. Never happens, not, not in my experience. Now, now, there is often a first time for people where suddenly, out of nowhere, they think, I, I want to come to the table. I have never done this before. I want to be part of this. I want to receive the body and the blood of Jesus and know him. And there is a, a true want there, a true desire, but it's initial and it's a beginning. But there's a different kind of desire that you find in your life where over time you've come to the table week after week with this community of people, with brothers and sisters. Something happens as you hear and you rehear this story every week, as you rehear Jesus saying, do this in remembrance of me. As you then eat meals during the week and you give thanks and you remember that Jesus gave thanks at this meal. Over time, doesn't it become something that you hunger and thirst for? I often find myself on Friday or Saturday looking forward to being in worship with you on a Sunday morning, specifically anticipating the time when we get to come to the table together as one family and remember what Jesus did for us. It reminds me every week that no matter what else is going on in our lives, in our community, that we are bound together by one Lord, one Spirit. Or think about the Bible. I, I know plenty of people who've wanted to start reading the Bible. But then, like 
many people who start reading the Bible found it difficult and realized that they didn't actually want to read the Bible as much as they wanted to watch TV. But talk to people who have done the work to, to understand the story of scripture. Talk to people who spend time every day listening for God's voice in the Bible. Um, Talk to people who are just excited on a regular basis to share with you what they're learning in the Bible and you will find people who hunger and thirst to read it, to listen to it. And this didn't just appear in their lives one day. It wasn't just dropped on them. The Holy Spirit formed this desire in them as they developed a habit of reading, a habit of hearing God speak through these words. If the culture of our world can shape our desires. So the culture of the kingdom of God can shape new desires in us. This is important as we think about our life together. In what ways are we cultivating new desires, the desires of the kingdom of God in ourselves and in one another and in our children? But James would say, if we really want new desires, we have to be willing to give up the cheat days. This is what the devil offered Jesus in the wilderness. You heard Tom read the story for us earlier. After Jesus' baptism, Jesus is led by the spirit into the wilderness where he's tempted by the devil. And Jesus is there 40 days and 40 nights. And Matthew just says, and he was hungry, right? Overstatement of the year. The power of God was in Jesus. And we don't get any indication that, that he wasn't allowed to eat. Like we're not told that God commanded some 40 day fast. But for Jesus, this was a time of preparation. What he needed and what he wanted was the word of God. He was about to enter into a season of ministry that was gonna be utterly dependent on the word of God, of hearing God's voice, of being assured of what God was doing through him, of what God's will was, of what his mission was. And so he needed this space where he was devoted to listening to God and where he desired God's word more than anything. And instead, the devil comes to him and offers him bread. What's a cheat day? It's been 40 days and 40 nights. Besides, God made bread. You need bread. Bread is a good desire. But what the devil was doing was tempting Jesus to use his power in a way that God didn't intend. The power of God is, is not given for self. And yet in a world where every king, every rich person uses their power for themselves, the devil's offer just makes perfect sense, right? If you are friends with the world, the devil makes all the sense in the world. But Jesus desires God's will above all else. God's power is to be used for others. And so he resists the devil. Three times the devil comes at Jesus in this way. The devil offers Jesus cheat days for bread. The devil offers Jesus fame, pre-YouTube. The devil offers Jesus power. And the point of these stories is that Jesus is legitimately tempted by all of them. That Actually, the desire in each case isn't a bad desire. He has a desire to eat. He wants to see God's glory and power in the world. And Jesus wants to rule over the kingdoms of the earth. That's his job. In fact, as the gospels go on, he will make bread. And he will perform powerful and mighty acts. And he will become king over all the earth. But Jesus serves a more powerful desire. He wants these things on God's terms. Jesus wants to serve his father and do his will. 
And so Jesus examines his desire, but then he submits them to God. And those that don't align, he resists. He resists the devil and the devil leaves him. Jesus lives in the world, but he is not of it. He loves the world so much that he will die for it. He eats with those who are in the world. He develops friendships with people of the world, but he resists their desires. He refuses to be formed by their desires. This is maybe most obvious in another story from the Gospels. Jesus has just told his disciples that he is on his way to Jerusalem and he, there he is going to suffer and he is going to die. And Peter, one of his closest friends, clearly doesn't want Jesus to die. And so he puts his desire on Jesus. Peter rebukes Jesus, telling him, surely you won't die. But then Jesus' response is so fascinating, especially in light of what James says. He turns to Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Do you hear it? Jesus resisted the devil in the wilderness. But here, once again, Jesus has to resist the spirit of the devil in one of his closest friends. Think about that. Friendship with the world. How powerful that influence is to go with the world. And you think, why were the disciples always fighting with each other? And they were. We, the disciples tell these stories of themselves in the Gospels because they were ruled by desires that come from the world, the, their desire for power, their desire for status, to avoid suffering, for, for gain. And so James writes to the early church, this letter that we've been in for months now. He writes this letter to new believers. And he says, listen, you are proud and you are arrogant if you don't think your desires need to be questioned. You're proud and arrogant if you don't think that your desires need to be submitted to God. James says to them, too many of their desires still come from being brought up in the world. They keep giving themselves cheat days. It's time to be done. It's time to humble yourselves before God, James says. James reminds them that, that God is calling them to draw near to himself. I love this. James reminds these, these people, these new believers, that God is still doing, even though they, like their Israelite brothers and sisters before them, are in the process of moving back away from God, of cheating on God, of, of turning toward other gods, God is still in the business of moving toward his people. And he calls them to draw near to himself. That this is what God's been doing since the Garden of Eden, calling to us, inviting us to draw near to him, to know him, to walk with him. But as you make a new habit of drawing near to God, it's time to also be done with the world. And so James says, resist the devil. I think in our sort of self-esteem culture, we probably have a hard time believing that many of our desires would find their origin in the devil that Jesus might, walking with us, say, get behind me, Satan. Mostly we like to think that our desires are just neutral, right? They're not bad. But James says, resist the devil. Your friendship with the world makes you friends with the devil. At least we often do his work for him and we don't realize it. If you haven't read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, it's a good read. But James goes on. He just has a bunch of little bullet points, things to do. Cleanse your hands of the world's stuff 
and swords and strategies and other words that start with S. I can't think of any other ones. Purify your hearts of the world's evil desires. James goes on, be wretched and mourn and weep over the emptiness of the life that is found in the world's ways. He says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom as you finally take seriously God's invitation to come out of the kingdom of darkness and humble yourselves before the Lord. He will exalt you. He gives grace to the humble. We're going to spend a little bit of time um, in community with each other, processing this. What, is this. what does this mean? And I just got one question and then a chance to pray for each other. Um, but this is the question. Um, what do you think about the idea that Christians commonly give themselves cheat days, where we give ourselves permission to be friends with the world. Does this idea connect with you? In what way can you think of examples kind of in your own life? Um, and, then, um, and then in our groups, we'll pray for each other that God would form in us new Christ-like desires.